All right, everyone, welcome back to track two. Uh, now we're going to move into a 30-minute talk by Ayana Paris about the ins and the outs of threat hunting. Not just blue, it's a team sport. So everybody give Yana a round of applause. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I feel really lucky that I can be here for a second year in a row, so thanks for having me. Um, so this talk is going to be about threat hunting and the relationships we have in an organization. So if you want to know how to threat hunt, we can talk about that later. This is going to talk about all the things we need to do around threat hunting. So I'm Yana Paris, for those who don't know me. I'm a hacker, a researcher, consultant. I recently moved to the Netherlands. I love to play video games. I love Farming Simulator. So I'm actually living my Farming Sim dreams at the moment because I get to work for an agricultural company that does robotics. So I'm hacking embedded systems and learning all about hardware. It's super interesting. Um, I've been in web application development for like over a decade. Like ever since I was a kid, I love to code web apps. Uh, and so it was pretty natural for me to move into AppSec and then also OffSec. So what the heck do I have to say about threat hunting, right? I'm also really chaotic. Like, I love chaos. I love being thrown in the middle of something. So think Call of Duty, middle of the match, you pass me the controller and I have to figure out the controls, uh, what my loadout is, and I get killed. So I get this really fast feedback loop of you did something wrong, you need to find out how to play this game. And that's how it is when I jump into a new organization as well. It's always super chaotic. I have to find out my flow. And if I don't flow with it, if I'm constantly flowing against it, I can't make any change. So imagine, I am a new security person in a small organization. There's only three of us doing security. We've brought up another organization as well. So we don't have any idea how they work, what they do. We know they're software developers. We know that they have some things in the cloud, some things on servers, some things on their laptops. Uh, one random team, a marketing team, decided that they wanted to spin up their own server and host their code there. So we have developers who are SSHing into a system. Uh, there's about six of them, I think. And they're not only treating the server as a development server, but also a production server. So the idea here is that if you're able to get access to this server, you're able to change the code of a live website. And this live website also has access to produ production data. So in my threat hunting mind, I'm thinking, OK, What's the psychology of an employee? Like, what are they thinking? What's the baseline activity of what this should look like? So we have people SSHing at random times of the day, usually between nine to five, but we make it extra complicated because now we have people working remotely all over the world. All right, now I have to think about their local time as well. So we're finding that usually developers are stopping work around like eight o'clock in the evening. So anything after that is a little bit weird. And on the weekends, they're only logging in like very occasionally, usually if something's gone wrong and they have to like fix something, so they're firefighting. So I create a hypothesis. I suspect that what I've seen when I've been pen testing, and also as a software developer, sometimes we forget to clean things up. So I found things like authorized keys for people who no longer work at a company, so they're able to SSH into a server. And what this means is that we're not really having a process or a way that we're sort of governing what is going on here. Uh, so with this particular one, I found that someone who had left the company a month prior had started accessing this server again. Like, what's going on here? Uh, I found that they were sort of getting a bit braver as well. So they've not only accessed it and noticed that their credentials are working, but a week later they've accessed it again and they're able to edit something on the server. That's a bit exciting, like what else can they get away with? They haven't been blocked, none of our systems have alerted us to this, like we don't even know this is happening or that this weird stuff is going on. Uh, I see the session times are getting longer, so I'm going through all the logs at this point. Their session times have been getting longer, data transfer sizes are huge, and the types of data that they're transferring onto their system is super questionable, like really sensitive documents, source code, things like this. The reason that I got to this conclusion, that I even found something weird was going on, like I was excited, like yes, my curiosity was rewarded in some way. 
It's because I had knowledge of software engineering and application developer teams. And by working closely with them in the past, I can understand like what users are actually doing and what best practices we may or may not be following. So I suggest to you, if you're doing threat hunting, make sure you're talking to your software engineers, application developers, and everything around that as well. And if that's sort of a new world for you, I recommend some of these books. This, these books will tell you a little bit about DevOps sort of culture within software engineering and what that actually means, but also with the Phoenix project specifically, why firefighting in an organization doesn't always help our security view on things. I also realized that we aren't always using what we have. So what I mean by this is we have many systems in an organization, maybe we have lots of logging, we have lots of people with different knowledge, but we're not always correlating this data either. As I dug more into learning how to build up a threat hunting function or maturity for an organization, I don't always like using that word maturity, but I think we understand like going from you know, one step to the next, making sure we have these capabilities. I noticed that these four pillars were really important. So having good data quality, knowing where this data is coming from, how it is structured, how can we actually access this? Like, can you access it in the first place? Is our threat hunting trackable and repeatable? If I was to get new people into my team, would I be able to allow them to do a threat hunt that I did last week? Or is this something that I just had in my head, did it, and, and that was it? What are we doing with those outcomes? Are we measuring anything? Are we measuring what we're learning? How creative are we with our hypotheses? Can we talk with other people so that we can make these even deeper? Can we use what we have in the organization to get insight into this as well? And as a software engineer, I am so used to continuous improvement. Like, if I code something and I get it wrong, my test is going to tell me, my tools are going to tell me straight away. I have to debug this code, fix it, and then try to merge back in. Then I have a code review, and that process can take a little bit longer as well. But at least I have other people and other people's eyes telling me what, where I can improve and adapt from there as well. All these pillars led to the answer of, is our threat hunting effective? So if I was able to hit some of these pillars, then I would be able to maybe answer this question. OK, so I jumped us into a, an example, but threat hunting, what do I mean by that when I talk about it in this talk? I'm talking about not just the malicious activity, but I'm also talking about suspicious or risky activity. So maybe a user has done something that you don't expect, and so we're detecting this as well. When do we actually do the threat hunt? So we may have already got an alert on something, but we're doing something reactive. We're responding to that alert. The threat hunt is the proactive approach of looking for this malicious, risky, or suspicious behavior. And when I was reading some research by the Poneman Institute, when I saw that it was 203 days on average to identify that any of this malicious or risky behavior was happening, I thought, whoa, like, what can we do differently? At a high level, my approach to threat hunting is these five things. So collaborating, who am I involving with? Hypothesis, like what are we actually hunting? How am I cr creating that hypothesis in the first place? Is it just reliant on me and what I have seen? Or am I involving other people in that conversation as well? The activity, so how we're actually hunting. What tools are we using? Is this a repeatable thing that I can do next time? By making the collaborate step a distinct like thing on its own, it, forces you to think about who else to involve. So I don't want to just rely on the security team itself. I want to rely on other domains across the business. I want to get other people involved because I want to teach them security language, what we are trying to achieve. And I think as we build up the capability and the knowledge of other domains, I think we can also get deeper threat hunts. Sorry. So, threat modeling. This is one thing that I use as well. Are you, does anybody here threat model? Awesome. Have you threat modeled a legal contract? One of my colleagues 
applied the STRIDE framework to threat modeling a legal contract. And I was like, well, how do you do this? And it was this out of the box thinking that inspired me to sort of apply the things that we're learning in security, the frameworks that we have, into other things as well. And so when we think about our home, for example, if we're threat modeling this, we want to protect the valuables that we have inside, so our assets. We might do that by locking the door, making sure that we have a door in the first place from an active threat, someone like breaking into that. But what about the passive threats, the things that we can't really um, always protect against or predict that are going to happen, like really bad weather? In Australia, during like the Christmas period, it's summer for us, but we get hailstones that as big as baseballs, and these can break like our windows. So what do we do there? You know, we can insure the home, we can get thicker glass, but I tried to apply this kind of thinking of what can go wrong and how can I detect that it's happening to developing the hypothesis as well. So I got all the individual points of, okay, we have an ex-employee, this is going to be our threat actor. Let's get into the psychology of them. How are they feeling? What are they thinking? Are they doing this maliciously or are they just curious? Because if it's me, I'm probably just curious. I know that the server has a bunch of juicy stuff. So this is the thing that I want to look for weird activity on. But I also know that it's connected to this marketing website. So what other data can I get to? If you are still learning threat modeling, I really would recommend uh, these resources. So Adam Shostak is also part of the working group along with Alyssa Miller and others for the Threat Modeling Manifesto and has a book, Threat Modeling, Designing for Security. Okay, I'm gonna jump over from threat modeling now to design, because I used to be a designer. That's how I started in like front-end web development as well. Design can be really confusing and difficult to understand. We create something and we expect people to use it in the way that we think they're going to use it, but are we doing the research? Are we seeing how people will actually use it? Because people like me will be sitting on a plane, putting in like a bunch of letters in a search field and crashing the system. Not intending to do that, but just because I'm bored. Uh, now I'm imagining like kids or just people doing this as well. So when you talk to your re UX research teams and your support teams, find out what are users actually doing? What behavior should we be looking for? What, is, what are some like weird hacks or you know, weird bugs that they have found? And is that something that we could be looking for and preventing as well? This also got me thinking about a, um, I was working for a business and they had a website that they were uh, creating and everybody could have a profile page, so an about me page. And we didn't intend users to be able to um, communicate through their about me page. So there was no chat functionality and the whole idea was of this website was for people to sort of create groups and tell people like what was going on in their sort of area, like it was, it was meant to be something local. And the about me section was meant to just say a little bit about themselves. Uh, but we found that people were actually using it to put things like their social security number or their birth certificates. We did not expect this at all. Like there was a whole underground like chat of weird communication communication happening and that got me thinking like how does this website actually work so I jumped in and I tried it and I found out that as I was using it uh, you could actually keep logged in for almost 900 days without it kicking you out uh, I also found that within the first few minutes it asked you to verify your ident identity and if you don't acknowledge that verification, you can still get tons of data from it. So profiles and profiles are being sent to you. And I was wondering, oh, can someone use this against us? Like this misused feature, can, is someone scraping it? So I had a look. I had a look through logging and I thought, okay, my hypothesis is here that someone can take advantage of this misused feature and find out personal information of people. I was finding that we had abnormally high session duration for some users. Now, not all users were trying to scrape and get tons of data. There was probably legitimate use cases there as well. But there were locations that we didn't expect. So we were expecting locally in one country, but we were getting this like all over the world. And I'm thinking, oh, this is a little bit strange, especially if we have like birth certificates and social security numbers, like who is taking this data? Uh, and I was also seeing many API calls. So people could just stay logged in, keep scraping and, and get everything off our site. 
Uh, and this got me thinking, like, who should we be talking to and involving in these conversations? Who sees this all the time? So when I'm looking at logs, you know, as a, if I put my red teaming hat on, I want to actually, as a hacker, blend into everything. I want to make that my traffic or the way that I'm interacting with the system look as normal as possible. Often I show organizations how much data I can find out about them without even like hitting their website once, so they don't know that I exist in the first place. And that's usually because there's lots of tools that have done the scanning for me. So are you talking to your platform engineering teams? Are you talking to your network teams? Some of you might be like, yeah, yeah, we do. But how are you involving them in this security conversation? Are they helping you build up that data quality? What do they know about it? What tools are they using at the moment? Can you leverage some of this technology? I've been part of conversations where one team wanted to talk to Palo Alto about firewalls and another team was talking to them about the same thing. And I'm thinking, like, why aren't you pooling your resources and talking to each other? And data. Like, I've been talking to this about, uh, about it a lot. Uh, are you talking to your data science teams and your data engineering teams? And if you don't have data science and data engineering teams, then talk to the people that like data, like me. <laughs> we like data structures. We like you know, making things look pretty. We like getting further insights into that. Um, you, you might learn something about data lakes. I won't go into that now. But basically leverage the information from people who are learning within your organization already, because we can't assume that we know everything. And by involving them, we might learn something new, like Jupyter Notebooks have been gaining a lot more popularity in security, but data scientists have been using this for a long time as well. And when I was studying data science like a few years ago, I thought, whoa, this is amazing. Like, what can I use this for? So I started with Jupyter Notebooks, you can uh, have like a runtime environment, so you can actually run some code in there. You can visualize data, you can analyze data sets. Uh, you also have Markdown and HTML, so you can make things look super pretty. And I was creating reports that I could send to other people, and they were looking like really great, and like, whoa, how much time did you put into this? It's like, well, you do it once, and then you just feed the data in, and it's spitting this out. Like, how, how nice is that? I was also using this for reconnaissance. So if I look up a website and want to do like content discovery and technical discovery, I have a whole Jupyter notebook that can kick off some automated scans for me already. And the kind of ana analysis that I like to do is looking at things like, well, what are the common naming patterns that are being used? Are they leaking like internal naming uh, conventions as well? And by using this information, like, what, how can I further that? Like, can I social engineer? Can I find credentials? Yeah, it gets super interesting. Um, the, and this isn't new for threat hunting. Uh, in fact, Roberto Rodriguez has some really great resources. He has a four-part series on Medium, and he started the uh, Open Threat Research Forge, so I really recommend looking at that. And if you like data and want yours to tell like better stories, better metrics, I also recommend Cole Nussbaum and Netflix. She has some great resources, like books and videos. So as a threat hunter, I'm trying to piece together different parts of information. So I might have like my atomic indicators, which are great, but how can I relate that to more data? How can I look at the whole behavior of things and go even deeper than what I'm looking at at the moment? So I want to involve other people into that conversation. Like with your threat modeling, a few of you said, yes, you do this, but what do you do with your outcomes? What happens there? Like, are you using that for insights about what can actually happen within your environment? And if you are, that's awesome. Like, can you share how you're doing that with me? <laughs> and I want to warn you, like, when you start looking for things, you're going to start questioning, like, OK, what is going on here? Um, I find tons of credentials in the weirdest of places. The temporary fix that just seems to stick around. The proof of concept always ends up in production code. I don't care what you're trying to tell me there. But it will end up there and you won't be able to change it because suddenly like things are breaking and you need to find a way to fix or rewrite it completely. And the shadow IT. Why is that happening in the first place? Are we asking the questions of what are we trying to achieve here? Like, you're using a different piece of technology. What did we block you from being able to do? How are we not enabling you? Like, what can we be doing better? 
And so the other message that I want to bring with this talk is when you are talking to different teams and different domains, I really want you to think about their pain points. I want you to think about the fact that people get conflicting priorities and messages, that sometimes there are so many layers of management that these kinds of things like threat hunting, it can get really difficult because suddenly we have I don't know, siloed off teams, people who are too scared to talk to security, you know, they think every time we go approach them, oh, what did we do wrong? But we need to change that conversation. And I think that the more that we reach out to these different domains and different teams, we'll start to make, we'll, we'd show them that their perspectives are actually valuable. Like, we care what they're seeing. We care what they, you know, deal with day to day. We want those deeper insights. And I hope some of my examples with the threat hunts that I was just curious enough to do, like I, w I was hope hoping I could show that by talking to other teams and domains, I gained those insights just because I had that knowledge as well. And what you'll get out of it, apart from learning how to coach, sharing knowledge with each other, I guarantee that you'll get some process changes because you'll find out that maybe we didn't have a process here in the first place, so why don't we create one? You'll get better monitoring because you're suddenly linking information that you didn't have before. Like now you have a good relationship with your platform engineering and network teams, so you're going to get better monitoring out of that. If you're a small security team like I was in a team of three and we had nothing, no tools, technology, no budget, I'm going to leverage what the rest of the business has as well. And I want to enrich those detections. I want to find out like the behavior that's actually happening in the environment, but not just external, like internal as well. Is there a behavior change that needs to be made? Is there a cultural change that needs to be made within software engineering teams or management teams? These are the questions that I like to ask. So share knowledge, seek different perspectives, practice your craft, and lead the change, because I believe that the more that we reach out to people, the more that we'll lead them into thinking, yes, like security is really a team sport, and so can threat hunting. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Do we have any questions? I think we still have five minutes. So let's say someone wants to get started and they've never done this before. What would be a good way to just start? Good question. So get started with threat hunting itself or, yeah. Um, so for me, I was curious and so what I started doing was, I'm not sure if any of you, you know, spin up maybe virtual machines or labs at home. Actually open up, you know, like a Windows or a Linux machine and start doing things on it. Start like, I don't know, doing weird stuff. Get an application that is intentionally vulnerable and start looking at those logs as well. I've got a few, um, a few resources here that you can look at as well. And I've put this internals here because I really think like, use what you have, use what's free, use what's open source. Uh, if you have a look at the Open Threat uh, Research Forge, you'll also find a whole bunch of research uh, yeah, like research on detections and how you can run your own threat hunting playbooks as well. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? Yeah. Have I done other talks that everyone could see? Yes, I have. Um, I was at the Diana Initiative last year, and my talk was called uh, Building Secure Applications Starts with Secure Relationships. So I think you can see a bit of a theme with this one as well. <laughs> Thanks. I'll also be at DEF CON on Sunday, so I'm running a workshop at the Red Team Village on Recon with Jason Haddix, so just stop by. <laughs> cool. Does anybody want to share their like experience at all on threat hunting itself or maybe like collaborating with other teams or domains? Yeah. Hi, my name's Topher. Uh, so I used to be a red teamer. I'm a solutions engineer now because I went to the dark side. But uh, <laughs> so you had mentioned about uh, threat modeling and being able to effectively communicate that and the outcomes of that to other teams. And so I just want to share what I found very successful in the past um, was taking it all back to the hacking methodology and teaching them about the hacking methodology and really easy to understand steps and ways and methods. And then if they understand that, 
it's easy to paint the picture and put your threat model on top of that methodology. <laughs> so like, that's what I found to be really successful in the past. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for sharing. Any other stories or insights? OK, cool. Oh, yeah. Oh, we've got two. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Hi. My name is Chang Tan, and um, I'm actually with, uh, I work with Daniel M. Kelly, as well as other operators. Uh, you might have heard of him, you know, revealing Worm GPT and uh, Dark Vert. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, just a show. Yeah, that's really cool. Thanks. <laughs> Um, I know you mentioned, uh, you know, threat modeling and working with other teams. Uh, what's your approach to, you know, introduce this to other teams? Because most of the time when security reaches out to any other team, it's like either it's more work or, uh, you know, there's something wrong. So how do you approach that? That's such a good question because I get asked that all the time. So I work with different organizations and the first thing that I always have to investigate is like what is their way of working? Like how are these these teams actually working at the moment? What tools are they using? What's their process? If they're using GitLab, like how are they using that? And then I start to paint a picture. I'm like, okay, so there's certain, there's certain times where a team gets together and starts to talk about their requirements. Can I add a sneaky question in there? Like, what's the worst thing that could go wrong? Okay, cool, what are we gonna do about it? So these couple of questions turns into a bit of a conversation and it doesn't have to take too long. It could take like five to 15 minutes, but they've started it. And we start to like see what their thinking is as well. We also do, uh, like depending on the team itself, if they like to share knowledge and they like to get together and learn things, then I might do like a, a specific workshop. And a little trick that I do is, and I learned this from a colleague of mine, is I do one, I say that there's gonna be one workshop and it's a limited seat workshop and I wanna see who's super interested and wants to get involved and they sign up. And then suddenly they're talking to other people about, oh, we learned this really cool threat modeling technique, like you really need to be able to do this as well. And they start reaching out to us. Oh, we wanna, like we missed out on that first, uh, you know, workshop. And tailor the workshops that fit with the culture of the business as well. I'm happy to talk more about that a bit later with you too, yeah. Awesome. No worries. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>